This is One Universe at a Time. I'm Brian Koperlein. Nanotechnology is a hot topic these days, but people have actually been using nanotech for thousands of years. You can see nanoscale gold dust in the paintings of ancient artists. Today we're talking with Dr. John David Rocha, Assistant Professor of Chemistry and Material Science at the Rochester Institute of Technology. We'll find out what's so special about nanomaterials. You hear a lot of talk about these nano things and that was okay. a revolutionary breakthrough. Okay. I guess, is nanotechnology a radical shift from what we've done or is it the next step? There's things that have been happening at the nano level forever. Nano in general, coming from, say, the governmental standpoint, describing what people classify as nanotechnology are materials, behaviors, that begin to occur when structures are formed at length scales of 100 nanometers or so. Okay, so 100 nanometers is? About 100 times the size of a general chemical bond. A microorganism commonly might be one micron, which would be 1,000 nanometers. Right, right, okay. So when you get below the size of, say, an individual cell, and you start then... Uh, looking at scales of one billion times smaller than a meter. Okay. So these are these are things basically smaller than bacteria. Right, things okay. smaller that are bacteria, smaller than cells. Some materials have a unique property change, and those mm-hmm. properties that change due to those link scales being in that nano regime are what start to be classified as coming under the umbrella of nanotechnology. Okay. Because those are unique properties that only come about based on that size regime. Right. And then they can be used in ways that we wouldn't normally use those materials. Right. Okay. Okay. So is is it also a structure thing? I mean, like plastics, for example, you can have Mm -hmm. long carbon chains that are on that scale, but But that's not considered nanotechnology? Generally speaking, no, because those materials would not have a property change. For instance, a polymer okay. could be a long carbon chain of any scale from a short one nanometer up to microns long, many, many long links, you know, a nylon rope that's the length of a hair. Right? Okay. The property isn't any different whether it's the length of a human hair or a short one nanometer strand. Okay. So, oh, okay. So, so, in, so, so in sense, there's the link scale that could one could try to describe it as nanotechnology. Right. But in effect, there's no real difference in that, right. so invoking that scale. There's something fundamental about how it behaves right. that makes it special, which yeah. is why you would call it nanotechnology. So um, it is a size thing, but it's not just a size thing. Correct. Okay. Uh, one great uh, example that's used a lot is gold. Okay. Uh, if we look at a chunk of gold, right, we can hold it, we can feel it. Yep. It looks great. It's, it has our, a gold color that we think of when right. we're in our right. rings or whatever. When we take gold and imagine just chunking it down in smaller and smaller pieces right. to get a gold particle that is now in the hundreds of nanometers or smaller, even tens okay. of nanometers regime, yep. the actual color of that material that we observe by eye, optically, spectroscopically, changes. It's not the gold color that we're familiar with. It now can actually vary its color from blues to reds all throughout the spectrum. So, so Simply, if you had gold dust right. and you made it finer and finer and finer, it uh-huh. would stop looking like gold and then it would start right. taking on this other color. Exactly. Oh, that's cool. And um, this was known, not understood, but known by chemists, let's say painters, right. artists, thousands of years ago. Okay. When you look at old paintings yep. that were coming into blues and reds, a lot of the coloration, many of these old paintings and stained glass windows and so on, came from nano gold particles that were actually in those. So they would throw these nano materials silver in silver particles. They would do these formulations, not understanding what was happening from the material side, right. but they knew what the end results were. So we've been using invoked. nanotechnology for centuries. We just didn't know that's Correct. what it was. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. From the fundamental science point of view, we are beginning to find those bits of information and now being able to, for instance, build from the ground up maybe okay. atom by atom, or move top down to achieve those scales and achieve the desired properties that we're trying to invoke. Okay. Buckyballs, the the carbon-60 yeah. molecules. Mm-hmm. There's been things where if you light a candle and you just look at soot, there are buckyballs right. within that soot. 
Correct. So making them in in a bunch of other stuff right. isn't difficult. Correct. But it's a matter of extracting it or making it consistently. Yeah. So those are major issues mm-hmm. um, with nanotechnology today. Uh, I would say some of the some of the grand challenges in effect with nanotechnology right, right now are preparing materials that are uniform and unique in their property and, and character. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, C60, right? right? In order to produce it in a high quality, always form C60 is near impossible. Right. There are ways, particularly if you want to make it on very, very large scales, right? Yeah, you can you make can, it accurate or you can make it cheap. Yeah. <laughs> but not both. But not That's both. The challenge. Too. Yes, yes. Right. The cheap side is you can you can make it a little bit more expensive when you produce it really cheaply and make kilotons mm-hmm. of it, but then now you have to go through the separation processes where, right. for instance, if you're just doing soot or you pull soot out of your fireplace, right. you could get C60. You can make a whole you ton of C60, ton but, of but C60. it's all within all the other within junk that you that, don't want. They, exactly. So you right. now have to do that sort of processing. And then quality of that material might be uh, of an issue. Right. Uh, related to C60 is something that people really like a lot and are excited about is the more recent carbon material for a Nobel Prize, which was mm-hmm. graphene. Right. Graphene, right. Which, is a, which is a sheet. We form graphene every day when we write with our pencils on paper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's literally that individual layers of graphite that come off when we use our pencil lead right. on paper. Right. Forming that in to get our amazing nanotechnology like properties that we're interested in. Mm hmm requires extremely clean, pristine layers of graphene that don't right. have defects in order to achieve these amazing properties that people claim right. and even report occasionally in the literature scientifically and so on. Right. To now then do that at large scales so that we could have thin single layers of graphene on a wall for an electrical contact or right. as a semiconductor in a computer. That's, that's tough. tough. That's, that's a tough. whole other ball of wax yeah. that people now... Um, you know, they want to dump money in, but they don't necessarily understand that, hey. It's kind of like a gold rush. Everybody right. goes to California hoping yeah. they're going to make it, but yeah. some will. Some will. And some, some won't. won't. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a lot of claims on, I've got the graphene over here. No, my graphene is better. No, yeah. my graphene is better. Yeah. Um, all these different ways that they're trying to make them, and no one can know for sure how well. I mean, one of the areas that I'm trying to specialize in is that aspect, what are the tools that are needed to analyze the material to help right. uh, the community understand. So your area is a- analysis? Analysis and characterization. Okay, okay. So, so you have to figure out can what I these help, things are. Can I help you make a better gold material if you're gonna try and sell it to somebody? Right. And how can I help that person that's buying it from you know that they got what they were paying for. It's almost like you're a diamond yeah. merchant. You know, I have to grade what the quality is yeah. and I have to exchange what that is. That's and, right. And it's so, exactly the idea. You know, so you're trying of, to make sure what that is and right. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So That's interesting. That. So I would I would make some stuff using a certain process and I give it to you and then you yeah. would kind of analyze it and say, well, this mm-hmm. is, you know, this much chaff and this much good stuff. And right, right. And here's and the if, quality of this stuff. And if we don't have the tools to properly analyze it yet, because it's a new material in this case, for instance, nanotechnology, something, right. something that someone's never made before. Or, uh, or claim to have p- some particular property, then we try to develop the tools to best measure. Right. So how do you how do you characterize it then? I mean, is it a chemical thing? Do you have to like put it under a scanning electron microscope? Yeah, or? there's different tools that that people utilize. One that you just mentioned, very expensive tool like a electron microscope. Right. Um, million right. dollar, multi million dollar, multi million dollar device that everybody wants to use. Yes. They're yeah. like telescopes <laughs> in reverse. Oh boy. <laughs> so you 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 know you can dump a lot of money into having a tool like that, and and right. those give you the ability to see things at the nanoscale Mm -hmm. you know literally Mm -hmm. uh, we could go down and look at things uh, on the single atom type of level right right so you guys can Um, see actual individual atoms then we can observe their shadows as it were yeah in the structure in the structure Um, we're looking at the energy differences that we actually Mm -hmm. observe and that's our our image that we that we pick up okay right but what i prefer to use in terms of tools and what i develop with my research is the idea of can i use light simple yeah, Optical because an line. electron microscope stands a beam of electrons yeah. at whatever the material is, and yeah. then how those scatter is how you figure out so what's there. Exactly. So you're using light? So we use light as in optical light from a lamp or maybe a pen laser type of coherent light you okay. know, of a single it, is color. Is it in the visible spectrum? In the visible, typically. Okay. In the visible, uh, sometimes in the ultraviolet 
range, sometimes in the near infrared. So we work in regimes that are very close to the visible, things that people okay. are m- more comfortable and familiar with. What, do, what um, does that let you do? That, that and what that allows us to do, do is, rather than be destructive with an electron beam and destroy our material, we can utilize looking at the material ideally in an in-situ process, right? Maybe when it's being made mm-hmm. or immediately after and not destroy the material right away if okay. we don't want to and probe the material to, for immediate feedback in a, feed, okay. in, a, in a loop, right? We can deal with processing of that material because if we haven't destroyed it to analyze it, then right. we can now influence how the material is uh, being considered. You know, maybe we want to know what right. happens to graph the skull particles, for instance, if we want to put them into a human cell right. and observe them, right? We can use light probing to do that type of experiment. And it's not destructive. And it's not destructive. You so wouldn't take an electron beam and shoot it at your liver, for instance, right. to try to look for the gold that is in your liver. It right? kind of reminds me of the idea that if you, you know, illuminating a, a manuscript or something with a blowtorch would yeah. be the scanning electron <laughs> scope, as right? opposed to a flashlight where yeah. you can still go back and, and look right. at it again. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, we think about even going back to this idea of the uh, stained glass windows and, and mm-hmm. thinking yeah, about how... Yeah, you don't want to destroy the windows. We wouldn't want to destroy the, the stained glass window, and, and we, but we can understand from the spectroscopy what are those colors or even probing them ourselves to understand the changes in that material rather than destroying the the fine, ancient, beautiful pieces of art that are in the museums, for instance. Doing your science without damaging. (laughs) That's really cool. That's idea. This is One Universe at a Time. I'm your host, Brian Koberlein. We've been talking with Dr. John David Rocha, Assistant Professor of Chemistry and Material Science at the Rochester Institute of Technology, about nanotechnology. In the second half of our show, Dr. Rocha gets to ask the questions, and I get to answer. Today, he'd like to know how we detect and characterize chemicals in space. The C60 molecule that I'm familiar with, the story goes, Croto was interested in finding a band that was out there in, in space, potentially related to carbon stuff. Right. And so that's how that's how they went about looking for something available, uh, signature-wise, that could be considered this uh Right. Yeah. Carbon this is chain. this is one of those things that we can't go. Well, I mean, now we can take some probes or we can get actual chemical samples. But uh-huh. the, traditionally, it would be you look at spectra of light. Right. So a right. gas cloud or a molecular cloud, it would either reflect light or it would emit light or it absorb light. Right. And we look at the patterns of light, what are called the spectra. And that's how we identify different chemicals. And yeah. You know, one of the surprising things is you can kind of imagine that there would be simple chemicals. There's water and carbon monoxide and things like that. But Uh we actually see spectra that are very complex. What are these? Yeah. You know, because you just see a pattern and you, you know that it's something. But you don't know what it is, and that's right. where kind of the chemistry comes in. You try and okay. synthesize it in the lab and do a, okay. a spectrum analysis and uh-huh. try and figure out what that is. Okay. So, yeah, okay. and there is carbon-60 in space. Okay. okay. And that was one of the things to to try and identify it. There was a name for the, this that they were looking for. Do you, do you have any? I don't remember, remember the name that? of what they okay. were looking but for. It, I know. It was different from what they, when they actually observed C60, if I'm, if I'm going oh, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah. We, we kind of have a long tradition. I mean, the, yeah. the kind of the first big identification of chemicals was actually in Halley's Comet. Back yeah. in back in 1910, they mm-hmm. were able to do uh, a spectrum analysis of the cometary tail. Okay. And, yeah. and was this uh, by just an optical uh, yeah, this was just type of thing? optical spectroscopy. The ob- visible or right, uh, transmission right. or absorption or right. something? It was just the emission of, the emission of lights. From the and light. okay. They looked at the spectra and they found a cyanogen, so cyanide. Okay. And of course, this naturally started a panic <laughs> because the the tail of Halley's Comet uh-huh. for 1910, the Earth okay. was going to pass through it. Pass through the tail. Uh-huh. And so, you know, here you have cyanide gas. And in 1910, people were familiar with cyanide gas because yeah, right. it will kill you. Right. And when this was announced, there were all of these doomsday scenarios. And people would go wow. around selling anti cyanide pills that if you take this when Halley's Comet would really? be. Really? Yeah, it was this huge thing. What? So we complain about kind of hype in the news. Yeah, yeah, there were, yeah. There was hype in the news about okay. how Co- Halley's Comet's going to kill us all. Yeah, right, um, right. 
But it was the first time in which we could really identify not a simple molecule. I mean, right. You could do yeah. water, you could do carbon sure. monoxide, but now okay. you've got what's really okay. kind of a more complex c- chemical. And yeah. ever since then, you know, as we've gotten better at spectroscopy, right. we found more and more complex spectra. Okay. And okay. therefore we find more and more complex chemistry. What's the state of the art, as it were, in, in thinking about uh, studying chemicals in space? Well, I think one of the things yeah. is, as we found more complex molecules, one yeah. of the real questions was, how could they possibly form? You know, okay. if you think about how chemicals form on Earth, it, it yeah. often tends to be a warm environment, and it tends to have enough energy to actually mix around things. Right. And if you look in space, these molecular clouds are actually quite cold. I mean, they're, they're okay. within a few degrees Kelvin, you yeah, know, 10, 20 Kelvin maybe. Wow. And so they're extremely cold. And mm-hmm. they're not necessarily very dense. So yeah. how can you get this kind of complex chemistry? And yeah. one yeah. of the things we found, both with simulations and with the lab, is that a lot of it is actually surface chemistry. So you're getting okay. surfaces of dust grains, for example, oh. that can then act as a layer or a substrate okay. so that chemical reactions can occur so to catalyze, to catalyze that, that okay. chemistry. And so you get those reactions. And even at cold temperatures, okay. they still can occur. Normally, we think about catalysis in the sense, uh, well, say industrial catalysis, you're talking mm-hmm. about transition metal type stuff that's really right. speeding things Your up. catalytic converter, Your catalytic for example. converters, for yeah. instance, right? Or cracking petroleum or whatever mm-hmm. out of the ground. You're really dealing with that, you know, transition metals. I wouldn't expect that those are in high quantity, or I wouldn't necessarily, but is that not the case? Or is there something else that, that is acting? There's not proteins, for instance. It's, it would no, be it's not proteins. It doesn't stuff. seem to be organic. You know, right. You know, is there the, uh, this sense that there's a high prevalence of these heavy transition metals that are part of the stuff? There are some transition metals. I think the big thing is when you have cold surfaces, Mm -hmm. you're getting... The, the Bose condensate level, you're getting uh-huh. it at, you know, super cool temperatures. Right. The, the chemical reactions change. It's kind of like nanotechnology. Okay. Yeah. You know, at those yeah. temperatures and in a vacuum, you have more opportunity for these complex interactions. Okay. And that's, you know, again, that's a little bit outside my field, but okay. it's, it's an interesting thing in that we're, we're starting to get an idea of where this origin of complex molecules in space right. actually are. Right. Can we study that, for instance, uh, in the tundra, the frozen tundra, the poles, some, similar things? I'm not things? sure about. I know I there's mean, some lab stuff where they do low pressure, so okay. kind of vacuum chemical interactions right. on surfaces, and right. that's where some of it's come from. Okay. The other part of it is computational. Okay. That, you know, yeah. we can start doing molecular computational models now yeah. because we have enough computing power. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's a big thing. Okay. And it's, it's kind of a surprising result because we wouldn't think... Yeah, you know, sure. The raw ingredients of of basic simple molecules. That was actually one of the other things too, is that they're not breaking apart as quickly as we necessarily think. Okay. There's a lot of things like ultraviolet radiation yeah, and right. high energy particles high energy that particles. you would tend to break apart molecules. You know, right. these kind of big complex molecules aren't necessarily stable. So when you say complex, that was my next thought. I mean, how, how complex can we get? I mean, are we talking about 10, 20 plus, 100, 100 atom complexes, or are we talking about three to five to six? Well, there's yeah. lots of three to five to six, but we are finding yeah. larger molecules as well. Yeah. I mean, it, okay. it's, it's not just carbon monoxide and formaldehyde yeah. and you know cyanogen and, okay. and alcohol you know mm-hmm. there's huge alcohol clouds in space right. everybody makes a big okay. joke about it okay <laughs> but but yeah we're finding yeah. complex molecular change and, and things like that in fact yeah. it's one of the things that's a big challenge now is mm-hmm. we have more spectra than we have data for yeah so okay. we have these spectral patterns and we know this is some complex molecule right. probably okay. carbon based but it's hard to figure out because in order to really compare, what we need is someone to go into the lab and go, okay, molecule A, here's the spectrum. Molecule right. 4,532, here's the here's spectra. The, yeah, right. And there is, there's kind of a, a lack of funding in that area okay. because okay. Yeah. it isn't sexy. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to look at 10,000 different complex molecules and here's right. their spectra. Right, right. And now, a lot of that stuff is data-based these days. A I lot mean, of it is I mean, data-based. And not, that yep. they're, not that we know every single molecule potential right right? but some of the databases are pretty big does it work that way too that you you know yep you you compare 
spectra to mm-hmm. databases and yeah. you try and figure out what these are okay um, okay but it's also you know in astronomy we could always use more data we always yeah. want yeah. more data yeah yeah so you know the okay. chemist should go and and find out all these molecules <laughs> and all these little variations sure okay. okay and and of course as you know it changes based upon temperature and pressure and stuff right the right. molecules the spectra will change Can so change. Yeah. if you have here's a database of a molecule at standard it, room at, temperature at CP, right. that doesn't okay. help us if we're looking at at, at, at 10 degree 10 kelvin 10 in kelvin. a vacuum right okay you know and that's okay. the, the kind of difference hmm. interesting so, it's, so when you're looking at the material here we, we talked about um looking at Halley's comet based on emission spectra mm-hmm. is that still the primary technique these days of you know, emission uh, and absorption uh, yeah emission and absorption. so it depends upon the nebula and some uh-huh. some nebula are between us and a bright source so okay. if it happens to be between us and a quasar for example then we can get mm-hmm. absorption lines and we can see that some are reflection nebula so that light you know ultraviolet uh-huh. light from a star might reflect off okay. of a gas cloud and then yeah. we can get the reflection off of that some of it actually glows and we can get some of that okay it it really is based upon the light we're looking at the spectra and and seeing what they are okay okay you know there's still a lot to be done but we know there's there's a lot more complex chemistry than we thought if you would have asked us you know 50 years ago if there's complex chemistry we'd say nah it's too cold in a vacuum yeah can't happen yeah and now we're finding all these complex molecules seeing that and so then you know this may be going far 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 away do we get drift is this is this maybe a source of where we're seeing life on other planets, let's say. That's, you know? I mean, that's one of the big uh, questions. Right. Um, we know that comets contain organic molecules and yeah. the type of organic molecules that can be the building blocks of okay. life. Okay. So we know that those building blocks can form in space. Right. And we know from various samples, organic molecules are there. Yeah. And they're there right. fairly common. Right. How complex is, again, one of those interesting questions. We have a limited number of samples, and we don't know, you know, what we're getting largely are things from comets. Okay. And that's that's kind of the one thing where we've had samples. Yeah, I see. Uh, that have actually been returned. In terms of the complex molecules, we're really looking at the spectra. And, okay. And that's kind of limiting for some of it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's one of the ideas, is that yeah. those building blocks could come to a planet that's habitable for life. Right, and right. That could help kickstart you know do we get false sense or is the chance or thought maybe is there a camp that says what we believe we detected you know organic life material on mars for instance or right a a planet a a satellite of jupiter organics Uh we can detect would we say organics from life no i mean we're there's no we don't have any conclusive evidence where we could say this was formed by a living organism right right but we are getting the type of complex molecules that you see in terms of building blocks in terms of complex structures it's kind of shifted the conversation a little bit because Mm -hmm. now that we know that complex molecules can form in space right and they can survive reaching a planet we yeah. know that you know cometary material that reaches earth still has complex molecules that kind of changes the possibilities at least in gets terms us, of it, it could seems you like seed it gets us things. into this idea of a false positive maybe when it comes to is that that's where i'm thinking oh you mean that, oh you know false positive for life for life for instance yeah i mean i guess that's possible yeah but it's also the people who really study the appearance of life on Mars, for example. Right. They're really cautious. The last thing yeah. you want to do is you want to come out and say, we found life. Oh, wait, no, we didn't oh, find no, life. Sorry. Wait, yeah. So, <laughs> My bad. <laughs> My bad. Oops. You know. <laughs> so I, I think it, it okay. is one of the, the risks. We, I mean, we can't. We can't simply say yeah. we found organics, therefore there's life. Yeah. Yeah. That that's okay. done. We yeah. cannot do that. That's and so, okay. even the vo- mm-hmm. the uh, Viking probes, for example, found yeah. interesting chemistry, and it looks like life. If you look right. at the, the okay. results, they, okay. they lean towards the type of things that we would see in living organisms. Right. But we've also found that complex chemistry that's not life can, in fact, do that same Chemistry's type of thing in terms okay. of reacting with things and absorbing oxygen and stuff. Right. And right. so, okay. Our devices have gotten better, but at the same time, the question's gotten more difficult. More, yeah, because we can't just say, "Here's organics, therefore life." Right, right. You know, it's okay. it's really a matter of you know, would yeah. we see fossils? Would we see reproduction? Would we see? That's those are now, harder now, experiments. Yeah, right, it goes beyond what 
may have originally been considered the answers that we wanted to, right. to see, right. find. But on the other hand, it kind yeah. of raises the possibility of life on other worlds because the complex yeah. molecules that we would see, okay. they didn't just form here. They actually are out in space. They right. are on other planets. They right. are on, on Titan. And, and so the possibility is there, but it's it, going to be harder to prove. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so there's a, there's a golden light there, but it's not yeah, quite it's sure. Yeah, it's the ray of hope and, yeah, and yeah. maybe the tunnel at the end of the railroad. Okay. But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. We've been talking with Dr. John David Rocha, an assistant professor of chemistry and material science at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Our program is produced at RIT with support from the RIT College of Science. I'm your host, Brian Coberline. Thanks for listening to One Universe at a Time. 